Thomas Yale, who's an associate professor at the National University of Singapore. Thomas received his BS and MS from Stanford University and his PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Prior to NUS, Thomas was a research fellow at Harvard University and Duke NUS Medical School. Thomas was a research fellow at Harvard University and he now develops machine learning algorithms to generate scientific discoveries from large scale data sets comprising thousands of subjects <clears throat> with brain imaging such as MRI, behavioral, genetic, and other physiological measures. By exploring large multimodal data sets, he seeks to discover fundamental principles of brain network organization, how brain networks are organized to support cognition, and how brain networks are disrupted in mental disorders. Thomas is a senior editor at NeuroImage. He is a recipient of the Mackay Young Scientist Award, the Mackay Young Investigator Publication Impact Award, and the OHBM Earlier Career Investigator Award. With that, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Thomas Yeo and his talk. Thank you, Fred, uh, and thank you, uh, Adam, and, and everyone for the invitation to this unique forum. So, so my lab develops and applies machine learning to generate discoveries from large-scale brain imaging data. And today I'll talk about our work on the organization of large-scale networks in the human cerebral cortex. As we all know, the human brain is a complex system with multi-scale spatial temporal organization. This figure here illustrate multiple skills from genes to neurons, to large-scale brain networks, to behavior. In my group, we focus on studying large-scale brain networks and behavior. But we've also begun using biophysical modeling to bridge the gap with micro-scale organization. To study large-scale brain networks, we use functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI. fMRI provides an indirect measure of neural activity based on neurovascular coupling. An illustration of neurovascular coupling is shown uh, by this beautiful video on the right, where whisker stimulation leads to neural activity and corresponding vascular dynamics. Now, even though fMRI is kind of a crude tool, it is still one of the few non-invasive tools that we can use to study large-scale brain networks uh, in the human brain. As demonstrated by Barack Biswal and others, Suppose we take a superior parietal region shown by this black circle. If we correlate this fMRI time course across the entire brain, we get a network of brain regions shown here. So this network is known as the dorsal attention network. And what is cool is that we can extract this network even when the participant is at rest in the scanner, not performing any explicit task. This correlation is typically referred to as resting state function connectivity. And over the past 20 years, there are many studies in humans and animals suggesting that functional connectivity can be a useful proxy of multisynaptic connectivity. Uh, let me just share with you one of my favorite studies. We know from animal studies that the cerebellum forms close anatomical loops with the cerebral cortex. Now, roughly speaking, cortical areas project to the pons uh, and the contralateral cerebellum. Um, and efferents from the cerebellum passes through the deep uh, cerebellar nuclei and um, to the thalamus and back to the cerebral cortex. This multi-synaptic circuits can be captured by resting state function connectivity. In healthy individuals, left motor cortex uh, has stronger function connectivity with right cerebellum than with left cerebellum. Conversely, right motor cortex uh, has stronger function connectivity with left cerebellum than right cerebellum. Now, because different blood vessels serve contralateral motor cortex and the cerebellum, the function connectivity is not uh, just the result of vascular artifacts. Furthermore, this contralateral function connectivity is disrupted in patients with focal lesions of the pons. So lesions in the left pons disrupt function connectivity between left motor cortex and right cerebellum, while connectivity between right motor cortex and left cerebellum is less affected. Conversely, lesion in the right pons uh, disrupt function connectivity between the right uh, motor cortex 
and the left cerebellum, while connectivity between the left motor cortex and right cerebellum is less affected. So overall, functional connectivity reflects some form of multi-synaptic synchronization across brain networks, uh, sorry, across brain regions, and is a useful tool for studying human brain network organization. So uh, the rest of the talk is organized as follows. Uh, there are three parts. Basically, in the first part, I'll talk about our work on estimating large-scale brain networks. And in the second part, I'll discuss um, the prediction of behavioral traits from resting and task function connectivity. And finally, I will use um, I will discuss the use of biophysically plausible models to be, to bridge the gap um, between large-scale brain networks and micro-scale organization. Let us move on to the first topic. So um, I will discuss our work on using functional connectivity to estimate the topography of large-scale networks. So this work uh, is done by Ruby, Awe Ping, Xiao Xuan, uh, in collaboration with Randy Buckner, Avram Holmes, and Ben Akrini. I've previously shown you this map before, and, and just to recall, the yellow and red regions are brain regions whose fMRI signal correlate the black circle. So this map was obtained um, by averaging across 1,000 subjects. And when I start this video, you'll see that the black circle is going to move around and we can see how the functional connectivity pattern changes. There are two points to this video. The first is that adjacent association cortex can have very different connectivity patterns. As the black circle moves around, the regions correlated with the black circle change a lot. And the second point is that much of association cortex is connected to other association cortex, but not with primary cortex. Now, of course, these observations are qualitative. Uh, what we want is to automatically discover the distinct patterns or correlations we see in the video. So we use a mixture model to cluster the correlation patterns into network of regions, shown here for seven networks. So basically cortical regions that are functionally connected together are given the same color by the model. We observe that some networks, such as these blue and purple clusters, are spatially confined. So these sensory and late uh, motor regions are spatially restricted in their connectivity in the sense that they're connect connected mostly to their neighbors. And by contrast, the majority of human cerebral cortex consists of distributed networks with far-reaching connections. This parallel topography is consistent with Goldman Rakish idea about the primate association cortex. So in her review, Goldman Rakish uh, argued that distributed processing in the primate association cortex is organized in a parallel fashion. So she basically argued that interconnected association areas tend not to have laminar projections with clear feed forward and feedback relations. So it is not just that these association areas should be on the same processing hierarchy. She is arguing that uh, the sensory motor processing hierarchy uh, may not apply to the association cortex. So there are two key features to this organization. So first, each association network comprises of uh, brain areas in the parietal, temporal, prefrontal, and cortical design, and that these regions are densely interconnected. The second key feature is that there are these are densely connected networks that exist adjacent to each other. And indeed, in our data, we observe this interdigitation of network components throughout the association cortex. Because we use a mixture model to perform the clustering, each brain location can only be assigned to a single cluster. So in the follow-up study, we use a hierarchical Bayesian model to estimate brain networks that can spatially overlap. So we found quite similar networks and also still observe the parallel topography in the association cortex. So in other words, the parallel topography is robust uh, to the choice of algorithms. And so far, the results I've shown you uh, is based on averaging across many participants. We know that simple averaging can blur out uh, intricate network topography across subjects. So, so um, Ruby divide, develop and devise an approach to estimate networks in individual participants. So here's a single participant from the Human Connectome Project. 
we see that for this individual, the networks also exhibit parallel topography in the association cortex. But compared to the group level, this topography is much more complex. Let us visualize the underlying functional connectivity data that gives rise to this complex topography. So here I'm showing the outlines of two networks uh, corresponding to the salient ventral attention network in blue uh, and the default network B in black. So if I go back and forth between the two slides, you can see that um, I, I, all I did is to take two networks and to draw outlines around them. Like before, this red and yellow regions are correlated with the time course of this black circle here. And when I start the video, the black circle is going to move around and we can see how the correlation pattern changes. We see that as the black circle moves around, the functional connectivity patterns appear to agree quite well to the networks de um, delineated by Ruby's approach. What is nice about Ruby's approach is that we can estimate high quality networks with much less data than previous studies. This is Ruby's uh, multi-session Harkon Bayesian model. I won't really go into it in details, but basically the top level models intersubject variability, the next level models intersession variability within the subject, and the bottom, uh, the bottom level models interregion variability within the network. We can learn all the priors shown in red from multi-session data. And with these priors, uh, we can estimate networks in the new subject, even if the subject only has one single FMI session. Here are the networks of four human connectome project subjects estimated with Ruby's approach. Uh, each column uh, is one subject. The first row is day one. The second row is day two. The, we see that the networks are highly replicable within a subject across sessions. And at the same time, these stable network features are different across participants. So for example, if we focus on the yellow arrows, notice that subject three and four uh, have this yellow default network uh, component in temporal cortex, which, and this component uh, is present on both days. But if you look at subject one and two, um, they do not have this yellow default network component. Ruby also shows that using 10 minutes of data, her model can estimate networks uh, that are of similar quality to other approaches using 15 minutes of data. Ruby also shows that um, individual specific network topography can be used to predict behavior. So basically, uh, if we have two participants and they have more and they have similar brain network topography, then they will also have similar behavioral traits. This is also true for network size. Uh, but network topography seems to predict behavioral traits better. In a follow-up study, uh, in the collaboration with Avram Holmes Group, um, Avram Holmes Group shows that individual specific network size and topography are also heritable. So here, um, I'm showing you the result for network size. Finally, using the same approach, uh, we find complex network topography in the cerebellum of two highly sample individuals. So these um, individuals have been scanned for 31 sessions each. Um, I'm using a flat map representation to show you the cerebellum topography of the two individuals so that we can appreciate the entire cerebellum all at once. Um, we can see that the complex topography is quite different across the two participants um, and, um, and actually quite stable within an individual. Our previous 2011 study found that at a group level, when we average across 1,000 subjects, um, there are perhaps three homotopic maps of the cerebral cortex and cerebellum. At the individual level, we find that this is also the case. Here is the primary map uh, in the anterior lobe, right, ending around cross one and cross two. The network order then reverses in the secondary map in the posterior lobe. And there is perhaps a, a tertiary map in the most posterior end of the cerebellum. To summarize, we found parallel distributed networks in human association cortex. This parallel architecture exists even in individual participants. We found that the size and topography of individual specific networks are heritable and predictive of behavioral traits. In the cerebellum of individual participants, we found that there are three maps of the cerebral cortex, 
But at this point, uh, we're not sure about the functional sequence of the three maps. So uh, all the code from our studies can be found on GitHub. This includes uh, aerial level parcelations at the group and individual level, which I, I'm not showing you today. Um, let's move, let us move on to the next topic. Uh, here in this next part, Jin Zhong, Angela, and He Tong did the work for this next part. In the previous part, uh, I mentioned that network spatial topography and size can be used to predict behavioral traits. In the next part, uh, we're going to use we're going to explore the use of functional connectivity to predict behavioral traits. This is of course not a new topic, right? There have been many studies relating functional connectivity with behavioral traits in both healthy and uh, participants and participants with um, illness. So, for example, uh, resting state function connectivity has been used to predict uh, brain maturity and flu intelligence in healthy individuals. However, multiple groups have shown that past state function connectivity is better than resting state function connectivity for predicting cognitive performance. So here are two plots uh, from Abigail Green's 2018 study. So each dot is a participant. X-axis is the observed flu intelligence. Y-axis is the predicted flu intelligence. We see that during the MBAC task, there's a stronger uh, correlation between predicted and observed flu intelligence, basically 0 0.325 versus 0 0.172 during the resting state. This is very interesting because uh, other studies have shown that task state only modestly influence functional connectivity. So on the left is a functional connectivity matrix during a counting task, and on the right is a functional connectivity matrix during resting fixation. There are differences between the two matrices, but the two matrices are largely similar. Indeed, uh, Katerina Graton has quantified the relative contributions of different factors to function connectivity. She found that task modulation of function connectivity is much smaller than group and individual factors. So it is quite interesting that even though task only weakly affects function connectivity, it can improve uh, the prediction of cognitive performance. So we wanted to find out whether network features that are predictive of behavior are different between resting and task states. Given that task state function connectivity is better at predicting cognitive performance, perhaps very different features are being utilized for prediction. Furthermore, most studies focus on the prediction of a particular behavior measure, such as full intelligence. So we also asked the question of whether predictive network features are similar or different across behavioral measures. So for this study, uh, we use the ABCD data set. Uh, there are three tasks in ABCD, MBAC, monetary incentive delay task, and stop signal task. We use the resting and task of MRI to compute uh, 419 by 419 function connectivity matrices using the Schaefer parcelation. So for each, basically for each brain state, we have a different function connectivity matrix for each participant. We then use the resting and task function connectivity to predict 36 cognitive personality and mental health measures uh, in individual participants. Um, for the regression model, we use kernel rich regression, but actually we use uh, linear regression, we get similar results. We then use uh, Stefan Hoff's approach uh, to extract predictive network features for each behavior measure and each resting and task state. So as shown in Stefan's study, uh, his approach is able to yield more interpretable features. And indeed, when we use Stefan's approach, uh, the predictive network features are very similar across regression algorithms compared with, for example, if we look at the weights of the regression models. Now, let us first answer the question of whether uh, predicting network features are similar or different across behavior measures. So of the 36 measures, only 32 were predicted better than chance. So I'm going to show you a 32 by 32 matrix. So red indicates cognition, gray indicates personality. These are mostly uh, impossibility measures. Uh, so blue color indicates mental health. Um, and these blue measures are from the child behavioral checklist. So here's the similarity of predictive network features across different behavioral measures. A green entry means that the predictive network features are strongly correlated between two behavioral measures. 
uh, we see that the diagonal blocks are mostly green. So this means that the predictive network features are similar within a behavioral domain. This is especially the case for cognitive performance, where the correlation can get as high as 0.8. Uh, now, in general, someone who scores well for fluent intelligence would also score well for working memory tasks, right? So we do expect some correlations. And yet, on the other hand, um, tasks involving episodic memory and executive function are known to activate different brain networks. So overall, we find the strong correlations across cognitive tasks to be somewhat surprising. Um, next, we want to find out if predictive network features are similar across resting and task state. As I've shown you, um, the predictive network features are similar within a behavioral domain. So we average the predictive network features within each domain, right? So we end up with three domain uh, domains, cognition, personality, and mental health. And for each domain, the different shades of blue indicate the resting and three task states. Here's the similarity of predictive network features across resting and task states. Uh, a green entry in this matrix means that the predictive network features are strongly correlated between two brain states. We see that the diagonal blocks are mostly green. So this means that within each behavioral domain, the predictive network features are similar across resting and task states. But uh, the predictive network features are not similar across behavioral domains. Although, uh, if you look at personality, personality and mental health, there is weak similarity in predictive network features. I have not shown you the actual prediction performance so far. Uh, you can check out uh, the preprints if you're interested. But basically, in general, in healthy participants, uh, we can predict cognition pretty well. Um, up to 0 0.5 or more for comp composite cognitive scores. Now, on the other hand, for other measures such as mental health and personality, um, the prediction in healthy participants is not so good, even though the prediction performance is better than chance. So then the question is, how can we improve prediction performance? A very simple approach, right, to improve prediction performance is to use a big data set, right? So here's an experiment from the UK Bar Bank, Hedong trained different regression models for predicting flu intelligence. And we considered kernel regression and three other deep learning models. Uh, Y-axis is the prediction performance, higher the better. Uh, X-axis is the number of training subjects. We see that as the number of training subjects increases, all regression model keeps improving. There's some bit of variation across the models, but, but essentially, uh, if we want better prediction, we should just use a bigger data set. But, but the problem is that not everyone has a big data set, right? So we want to somehow translate predictive models from large data sets to new unseen phenotypes in small data set. So this point about new phenotypes is very important, right? Why would people collect small data sets, right? Because they want to study something that is not found in large data sets. So it is not interesting, it, at least for us, we don't think it's interesting to simply translate a fluid intelligence prediction model from a large data set to predict fluid intelligence in a small data set. In our mind, it would be much more useful if we can translate a fluid intelligence prediction model from a large data set to predict some other behavioral trait in a small data set. So the key idea uh, here is that the vast majority of phenotypes are not independent, but they are actually correlated, right? So on the right, I'm showing the correlation um, among 65 non-brain imaging phenotypes in the UK bar bank. Many studies have found basically a relatively small number of components linking brain imaging data and a wide range of non-brain imaging phenotypes. This includes cognition, mental health, demographics, and other health attributes. So for example, um, in a I think 2015 paper, right? Steve Smith found a single brain behavior component in a human connecting project. Uh, Carla Miller found several components in the UK Bell Bank. Uh, same with Cedric Xia in the Philadelphia Neurodevelopmental Cohort. Uh, and my postdoc, Valeria, found three transdiagnostic components in the UCRA dataset. So basically, in general, phenotypes are, are correlated, right? And we expect that a unique phenotype from a small data set right, this unique phenotype will be correlated with some other phenotype in an existing large-scale population data set. 
So Ho Tong developed a framework to exploit these correlations. Uh, he called this approach meta matching. Uh, we consider 36,000 participants from the UK Bar Bank with uh, 67 non brain matching phenotypes. Uh, we divide the data into two groups, a training and test meta set. So importantly, participants and non-brain imaging phenotypes do not overlap between the training and test meta sets, uh, which is important because we want to make sure that the algorithm trained on the training meta set can generalize to new participants and new phenotypes in the test meta set. Hertong developed four meta matching algorithms exploiting the correlations among the non-brain imaging phenotypes. And here's the result. So x-axis is the number of participants uh, in the test meta set, 10, 20, 50, 100, or 200. So this is to simulate a small data set. Now, of course, um, since these numbers are quite small, we repeat the procedure 100 times. Y-axis is a prediction performance, averaged across 100 trials and across the 34 non-brain imaging phenotypes in the test meta set. Here's the prediction performance of classical coronal regression. And just to be clear, for example, let me give you an example. So this box plot is the prediction performance uh, when we train coronal regression with only 100 participants in the test meta set and perform prediction on the remaining 9,900 participants in the test meta set. And here's a prediction performance using uh, Hertong's meta matching approach. Uh, we can see that the improvement is really quite dramatic. Uh, just to emphasize the size of the improvement, here's a prediction performance uh, using classical cone regression with 100 participants versus 1,000 participants, right? So we can see that um, just by increasing the number of, of training participants from 100 to 1,000, we get a very big boost in prediction performance. And with meta matching, we can achieve the same prediction performance using just 100 subjects. So this experiment was done in the UK Biobank. Uh, we have now shown that models from the UK Biobank can be translated to the Human Connectome Project, even though these are um, these are different scanners, different pre-processing, uh, and different age groups. To summarize, we find that combining resting and task function connectivity improves the prediction of cognition, leading to pretty good prediction performance. Even though the prediction of personality and mental health is statistically better than chance, to tell the truth, the prediction quality is not that great. We find that predictive network features are similar within behavioral domains, but different across behavioral domains. Predictive network features are also similar across resting and task state. And overall, we found shared uh, brain network features that account for individual differences within broad behavioral domain, domains. But these network features are different across behavioral domains. We have developed a meta matching framework that translates predictive models from large data sets to new phenotypes in small data sets. Because meta matching uh, exploits correlations between phenotypes, it might not work well for rare phenotypes that are not correlated with anything. Um, however, there's still a long way to go in terms of improving prediction performance. Uh, my group has experimented with various approaches to improve predictions. Um, and these different approaches have been developed in parallel, uh, but perhaps by combining them, we can get further improvement. And so overall, there's still a lot of work left to be done. Our code is publicly available, uh, pre-trained meta matching model from 36,000 UK Bar Bank participants is also publicly available. Let us move on to the last part of the talk. Uh, Xiaolu and Peng did all the work. Uh, so, so far in, th in this talk, I focus on large-scale brain networks, right, and their relationship with behavioral traits. Uh, I'll now talk about biophysical modeling uh, to bridge macro-scale and micro-scale brain organization. Um, there's, of course, a very long history in modeling spiking neurons, right? and uh, models of these spiking neurons can be coupled together with MPAR, NMDA, and GABA receptors. Neural mass model simplify these detailed spiking neuronal networks by capturing the average dynamical behavior of cortical regions at the level of neuronal populations. So the resulting mean tube model is able to generate large-scale brain dynamics with relatively low parametric complexity. 
We will focus on the dynamic mean field model proposed by Gustavo. Basically, in the mean field model, each cortical R and Y is represented by a system of nonlinear ordinary differential equations coupled together by structural connectivity. This structural connectivity can be from diffusion MRI, it can be from invasive track tracing studies in animals. So, and, but in this talk, we will basically just use diffusion MRI. So the mean field model typically has many parameters controlling local synaptic properties. These parameters are typically manually tuned. Um, so it's common to just assume that the parameters are the same across the brain. If not, there's simply too many parameters to tune. However, given that different cortical regions have distinct cellular properties, this is not biologically plausible. So Peng developed an algorithm to automatically estimate the mean field model parameters. Because the estimation is automatic, we can allow two types of local synaptic parameters, uh, the recurrent connection strength, and external input to be variable across cortical regions. We apply his approach to the human connectome projects and we get much better fit to function connecting the test set. And what is quite cool is that the estimated model parameters exhibit a very intriguing spatial pattern. So on the left is the external input current and in the middle is the recurrent connection strength. So in this study, we actually allow um, the model parameters in each region to um, to vary, to change, to, to be different, right? And, and they can be very different, right? And yet we get this quite uh, intriguing spatial pattern, which agrees quite well with resting state network shown on the right. So the spatial patterns are correlated with neuronal cell density from histology, uh, is correlated with T1, T2 estimate of intracortical myelin, uh, is correlated with the first principal gradient from Daniel Margulies. Uh, we also did a meta-analysis of 83 behavioral tasks, and the spatial patterns also agree with the meta-analysis. So overall, without assuming the existence of a hierarchy, the estimated model parameters reveal a large-scale cortical gradient. But how well do our model actually explain the fMRI data, right? So, so far, we have computed function connectivity by correlating the entire fMRI time series. But this assumes that the underlying function connectivity does not change over time. Um, therefore, many studies have computed function connectivity over a short time window. So for example, here's a function connectivity matrix uh, computed using fMRI data during the short window shown here. Uh, we can slide the window and compute another function connectivity matrix. And we can continue sliding the window and we can get many function connectivity matrices. So this is often referred to as time varying function connectivity or dynamic function connectivity. So at this point, we have so many matrices, right? Corresponding to so many sliding windows. Um, what can we do with the matrices? So one thing that people do is to uh, compute correlations between all pairs of function connecting matrices. And so we get this matrix shown here. So this is a T by T matrix, right? Where T is the number of sliding window. We call this the functional connected dynamics matrix. Uh, this, was, this was not introduced by us, but, but um, introduced by previous studies. The diagonals of the function connectivity dynamics matrix are high because of autocorrelation in the fMRI data. What is very intriguing are these off-diagonal blocks of recurring function connectivity patterns. So what was intriguing to us was to try to understand the mechanism driving these dynamic fluctuations. There's been some um, work work on this topic um, by manually tuning the parameters of biophysical models, uh, such as the excellent work from Andrew Zelaski and Eric Hansen and many other people. <clears throat> so how does Peng's relaxed mean field model generate, um, does Peng relaxed mean field model generate realistic functional connectivity dynamics? This is the functional connectivity dynamics matrix of a single human connectivity project subject uh, here's the functional connectivity dynamics of the relaxed mean field model when we fit it to static functional connectivity. So this is from Peng's paper. Uh, we can see that we have this very flat functional connectivity dynamics with no recurring connectivity pattern. So this is very sad. And to add insult to injury, right? Uh, in our previous work, we found that a simple first order autoregressive model can generate highly realistic functional connectivity dynamics. So basically, a more complex model does not work as well as a simple model. 
So Xiaolu developed a new algorithm that allows us to fit to both static functional connectivity and functional connectivity dynamics. So this results in much more realistic dynamics shown here. Let us dig deeper uh, into the underlying functional connectivity dynamics. So this is the functional connectivity dynamics matrix of the simulated model. Um, the red blocks reflect time periods where the functional connectivity patterns are stable over a long period of time. There are also time periods in which the functional connectivity patterns are stable only for a short period of time. So the red diagonal you see is basically just autocorrelation in the data. We hypothesize that the brain might be exhibiting multi-stability. Um, so there might be periods during which the system is functioning in this low amplitude state. And in this state, the system is dominated by noise. And there might be periods during which the system is functioning in this high amplitude state, right? And in this state, there are large fluctuations in the systems. I won't go into the details, but basically Xiaolu found that the amplitude of the fMRI signals do appear to track these state changes. Here are the maps of how well uh, the amplitude of different brain regions track functional connectivity state changes. So on the left is the simulated results, and on the right is the real data. We see that sensory motor regions tend to have high value, so the amplitude of sensory motor time courses seem to track functional connectivity dynamics especially well. There's also a very strong agreement between the simulated and empirical spatial map. But these are just correlations, right? The, the nice thing about having a computational model is that we can actually uh, manipulate it to test our hypothesis, right? So in this case, our hypothesis is that sensory motor regions are driving these um, dynamic changes. So here's a simulated functional connectivity uh, dynamics matrix from the mean field model, right? Uh, if we zoom into this part of the matrix, we see that the system is basically in this low amplitude state where the correlations are only driven by autocorrelations. And our hypothesis, if you recall, is that sensory motor regions might drive functional connectivity dynamics. So we inject noise uh, for one uh, TR, one time point, in the sensory motor regions. And we find that the system seems to have transitioned into a high amplitude state, at least for a short while. On the other hand, if we inject noise into a different set of regions, we do not see such behavior. So overall, it seems that sensory motor regions um, might be drivers of functional connectivity dynamics. We also found that the spatial distribution of sensory uh, motor drivers correlate with differential expression of power albumin and somatostatin neuro interneurons. So um, in previous studies from Auburn Holmes group, they show that the differential patterns of power albumin and somatostatin interneurons have been linked with fMRI amplitude. It is related to fMRI amplitude. Um, one important thing to note is that even though we correlate with the um, power differential expression of power albumin and somatostatin into neurons. This correlation also holds for the first genetic principle component. So to summarize, we've demonstrated that it is possible to automatically fit neural mass models. This allows us to explore more biologically plausible models by allowing each cortical region to have different local circuit properties. When we parameterize our local circuit properties with anatomical and functional gradients, we achieve the most uh, realistic static and dynamic function connectivity. We also found that the amplitude of reasonable signals seem to track functional connectivity dynamics. And by perturbing the mean field model, we show that sensory motor regions might be drivers of functional connectivity dynamics. Finally, we found that the spatial distribution of sensory motor drivers correlate with differential expression of power albumin and somatostatin into, excuse me, into neurons, as well as the first genetic principle component. So the first genetic principle component has been shown to correlate with uh, the spatial distribution of genes coding for different excitatory and inhibitory neurons, uh, which might reflect spatial heterogeneity in excitation inhibition balance. So overall, this suggests perhaps a, a potential link between uh, functional connectivity dynamics and heterogeneity in excitation inhibition balance across the cortex. As always, uh, the code of this project uh, can be found on GitHub. So to summarize, we found a parallel distributed networks in human association cortex. Uh, the network exists at a group level as well as in individual participants. This parallel topography exists even if we allow networks to overlap. 
an individual network topography, size, and connectivity are heritable, and they can be used to predict behavioral traits. Predictive network features are similar across behavioral domains and across resting and task states, but predictive network features are different across behavioral domains. Combining resting and task function connectivity allow us to predict cognitive performance very well. Out of sample R is often bigger than 0.5, especially with composite cognitive scores. But unfortunately, this is not the case for mental health and personality measures. Um, given that functional connectivity and predict cognition quite well, it is a bit unclear to me whether the issues with fMRI or some other factors, uh, for example, perhaps how mental health and personality measures are currently measured or conceptualized in large-scale data sets. To achieve high prediction performance, we need large data sets. And the good news is that predictive models from large data sets can be translated to predict new phenotypes in small data. By combining large-scale circuit models with modern optimization techniques, we can estimate the local synaptic parameters of biophysical models. This, this uh, presents a possible way to bridge macro-scale brain organization as measured by non-invasive brain imaging with micro-scale organization as measured by invasive studies, uh, whether it's in ex vivo specimens or in non-human animal models. Before I end, I'd like to thank all my funding sources. I'd like to thank past and current members of my lab. I've highlighted those uh, whose work I've shown you. And of course, I also like to thank all my collaborators. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Yale. This was a wonderful talk. We have a few questions. Um, if if it's okay to go over them before we move. To oh yeah, sure, sure. Okay, great. Um, so we'll answer these three before we move on to the official Q and A session. Sure. This question comes to us from Desmond Oates. Mm -hmm. For task functional connectivity, does it matter if you regress out the task event versus ignore the task events? So in our study, we don't regress um, the task events. Um, if I recall, um, we did do some experiments with it. And in general, uh, it kind of gives similar results, although th there were some differences, of course. Um, Abigail Green, actually, from Todd Constable Group, actually have a follow-up study um, on the effects of, of task uh, events themselves versus, um, yeah, versus the, the underlying task function connectivity. Uh, you, you can check out her paper, I, I think is in cell, cell reports. This next question comes to us from Nicholas Blau. Uh, he says, very interesting talk. Uh, can you provide further details on the meta matching algorithm? Um, so maybe if you can go to your slide with the link. Oh yeah, sure, sure. Um, so it's actually kind of a, kind of a, I would say silly, Simple algorithm, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> a kind of a really naive algorithm, and it surprisingly worked really well. So first of all, I, I want to mention that this idea of generalizing from um, to new phenotypes, right? In machine learning, this is called meta learning, right? Um, that's why the algorithm is called meta matching. And in and we have actually started exploring some more complicated machine learning algorithms. And our collaborator, Simon, suggested to us a baseline. And this baseline works so well that it became our main meta matching algorithm. Uh, but, but basically, the idea is that if we already have predictive models from the last training set, uh, we simply use the apply the prediction models from the last training set and apply it to the uh, participants from the... Um, this is a bit hard to explain. If we apply to the participants from from the the, the the participants from the test meta set, and then we see which let's say we have, um, let me see in this example. Okay, sorry, I'm explaining this very poorly. Okay, um, okay, so um, suppose we have thirty three predictive models, right? This is now training set, right? We have with twenty seven thousand participants, right? We have thirty three predictive models. Right. Um, of this 33, we apply these 33 predict predictive models, let's say in the 100 shot case, right? We take 100 test participants 
and we apply these 33 predictive models to this 100 participants, right? So this gives us 33 predictions in this 100 participants, okay? And we check of these 33 predictions, which one best correlates with the new phenotype we're trying to predict, right? So then, for example, let's say we're trying to predict working memory, right, in the 100 participants, right? If we consider the 33, the previous 33 predictive models, right, presumably uh, the predictive models for fluid intelligence might correlate very strongly, might also be good prediction for um, working memory, right, in the 100 participants, right? And so then we simply use that fact to translate the model from the training set um, to this 100 participants. Um, so that's actually the basic uh, meta matching model. In the more advanced uh, meta matching model, we, we basically add a few more bells and whistles on top of that. And, and that improved things a, a bit more. Right? You can see that the, the key improvement, actually, the largest improvement actually comes from, um, comes from this, this idea that um, if there's a phenotype, let's say like fluid intelligence, right? a fluid intelligence prediction model, is going to probably correlate pretty well uh, with uh, working memory in, in, the, in the new data set. I hope that makes sense, Fred. I mean, is that even understandable? Yeah, I, I, I'm. I don't. Sorry, I, I don't think I'm um, okay, explaining it very well at all. Uh, yeah. Well, we can also have uh, Nicholas ask um, further further questions as well later. Right. Uh, if it wasn't clear. Now, uh, our last question uh, comes from Priya. Uh, Priya says, "Thank you very much for the informative talk. Very informative talk. I would like to ask if you think such prediction of behavioral traits based off connectivity analysis." would be possible with EEG or MEG data instead of fMRI? What are your thoughts? Well, I'm pretty sure they, they should be um, quite predictable as well. Um, and from what I understand, I believe that, uh, if I recall from, from Twitter, I do I do remember people uh, mentioning that there are these last year open EEG data sets available now with a thousand participants. So, so uh, I think it, it might be totally worth it to try. And yeah, similar approaches could probably be applied. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, great. If anybody has any other questions uh, for Professor Yeo here, feel free to type them in the Q&A tab. Otherwise, we will migrate to the next Zoom room. I have posted the link over to the chat. Um, Adam just posted it again, just in case. And uh, we will see everybody there. Okay, bye bye. We go now, right? Yeah. yeah okay. We'll let's plan to let's plan to start it at uh, ten o'clock. Uh, ten a.m. But yeah. you can but you can just head in there. Um, I'm just gonna leave this. I'm just gonna leave this open so people have time to get the link. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. All right. Excellent. See you over Recording there. Recording stopped. <laughs> All right, Nicole. I hope that was a uh, good uh, pace, by the way, for the intro. Thank you so much, Fred. You did a great job. Thank you.